Good morning, everyone, and Hazak Maru. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning as we are studying the very, 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 very juicy Pirasha, Vayeshev. And Vayeshev starts with a Vav because it's very. No, I'm kidding. Okay, fine. Here we go. Vayeshev Yaakov, Yaakov Avinu. And Yosef grows up, unfortunately, without a mother. <clears throat> you can imagine difficult times. And his father, Yaakov, of course understands that he doesn't have a mother. So he gives Yosef a little extra love, a little extra treatment, no harm, no foul. But there was some harm, and there was a lot of foul play afterwards. Yosef gets a coat, and he starts, you know, having a little extra confidence, skipping a step, he's having dreams. He's, you know, I wouldn't say he's playing this the smartest, if you ask me. He's definitely making some mistakes. You know, if you have a dream that your brothers are going to bow down to you, <laughs> wouldn't necessarily share that dream with them. But Yosef maybe is lacking some, you know, uh, EQ. I don't know what he's missing. Some um, uh, just people skills. Yosef, you know, keep it to yourself. But he tells his brothers, you know, you guys are going to bow down to me. And then he has another dream and he says it again. He didn't learn his lesson the first time. And his father tries to kosher everything. His father's like, um, come on, these dreams, Yosef, obviously, are not real because your mother is dead and there's no way that she could bow down to you. Can me and your mom actually come and bow down to you? Bottom line, the brothers were jealous. The brothers were jealous. There's no... The Pasuk's very clear about that. There was now friction, right? Friction between siblings. What's new? Nothing changed. Okay. Well, let's fast forward. The Pasuk tells us, that the brothers one day, they go out to shepherd in Shechem. Now we know Shechem has already, that's not a good place for the Jewish people. That's where what happened in Shechem already, right? What happened in Shechem? Give it a couple of seconds. In Shechem is where Dina was abused, abducted. So, very good, Dina. So, um, it's already ba- it's a ba- it's a place that's designated for Puranut. Vayomer Israel Yosef. So Israel, calling him Yos Israel. It's Yaakov. He says to his son, "Your brothers are out in Shechem. Go see how they're doing." Well, Rashi says, "Makom muchan lePuranut. Sham kilkelu ashvatim. Sham enu adina. Sham nehelka machul be David. Shechem is just seeded with bad energy. Okay, bad place." Well, he goes, Yosef, to check up on the brothers like his father commanded him. And this man finds him. Rashi says, Ish ze Gavriel. Always the word Ish is Gavriel. The angel Gavriel. So, on, again, it was a man. To the naked eye, it was a man. But it was really deeper was the angel. And the man says, what are you looking for, my dear son? She says, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me, where are my brothers? Where are they shepherding? And like, if there's like a moment in time that you could just go back to and say, Yosef, don't do it. Right? It's like right here. This is the moment. And by the way, the man, the Gabriel, tries doing it. You know, he can't do it explicitly because he take away the guy's free will. But you'll see in a minute what the Rabbeinu Bahia says over here. The man says they left. I overheard them saying they're going to go to Dotan. And Yosef goes and finds them surely in Dotan. Of course... Unfortunately for him, he didn't realize what were they going to Dotan for. But um, Rabbeinu Bahia over here, and Rashi says similarly, 
it says, well, the, the, he doesn't have to say, Nasi'u <laughs> Mizeh. You know, they left. Thank you for stating the obvious. I see that they left. That's why they're, that's why they're not here. That's why I'm asking you, where are they, mister? You know, you don't need to tell me they're not here. <laughs> like, if you know, like, you know, when you're, when you're doing like these school trips and it's like, okay, raise your hand if you're not on the bus. You know, remember those little uh, cute little jokes? Ra- All right, say, say here if you're not on the bus. Obviously, they're not here. I asked you why, I asked you where they are because I knew they're not here. Yosef says, where are my brothers? The guy doesn't need to say they're not here. Uh, thank you. I can see that. I'm here and they're not. So clearly the angel when he says Nasi'u Mizeh explains Rabbi Nuba, Rashi says this Hisi'u Atzman Minahava He didn't mean geographically, geographically He meant as far as brotherly love You Yosef are looking for your brothers? Well I'm sorry to say Nasi'u Mizeh They're not looking for you They're not looking to make peace they left. Not only they've left. Look at this, Rabbeinu Bahye. Hamalach ratzal egalot liyosef machshavata mara'a. The angel here is trying, in within whatever rules of nature he's confined to. There are laws of angels. I don't know what they are, but the angels are limited in what they can and cannot say. So, seemingly, he's trying to hint to him, in whatever code is allowed. Yosef just Yosef couldn't pick up on the code, on the word, on the hints of uh, you know when when, when you were, we were young we played the charades game right, all these Pictionary games. Yosef's not picking up on it, right? He's not getting the hint, as we say in English. He didn't he didn't see what the angel was trying to warn him. Shehu nechlei datot. What does that mean? Nechlei datot. Over here means to engineer. They were trying to engineer bad things. Yeah? Uh, Rashi says, Levakesh lecha nechlei datot she mitucha bahem. Right? They were going to look for legal rights to try to um, accuse Yosef. However, Yosef again doesn't hear any of this. Halach ahar hanegle v'radaf aharehem. He thought, he heard the words. Literally, they went to Dotan. He didn't understand the subtle message of the Dotan from the word dat law. They were looking for a pretext, a legal pretext. He didn't hear that. He just heard what was said. And again, it's very very deep deep lesson here that in life it's important to hear not what people are saying but to hear what they're really saying, right? If a man comes home and says to his wife, how's your day? And she says, fine. Her word was fine. But you could tell if a man knows how to hear well, <laughs> it was far from fine. <laughs> You'd be very wise to know that it wasn't fine. It was, maybe she got a fine. Something happened. It wasn't fine. And he would be wise to ask. Oh man, sounds like you had a bad day, honey. And don't worry, she's going to say, no, really, it was fine. Two times. And at least five times you have to ask. If you're a smart husband, you know that already. But either way, in life to hear, to hear what's sometimes the unspoken. Yes? Okay. Well, it's really what the rabbis are saying in the Midrash, that they left here. They left the brotherlyhood love. Okay. Well, anyways, Yosef Atzadi goes, and we know it's just bad news for him. When he gets there, the brothers, they actually, things happen that they try to do before selling him. We know they sell him eventually. But they try to kill him. The Pasuk says, Pasuk 18. They see him from far. Before he even got there, they tried killing him. So explains Rabbi Nubahye. Simply, they tried calculating uh, what should we do when he comes. But they said, well, maybe we'll send dogs after him. 
let's just kill him with a dog, you know, just something, you know, will, will, um, from far, they already conspired. They weren't successful, says Rabbeinu Bachye. And therefore, as he got closer, Amrule Horgobi Adai, and he said, okay, well, the dogs didn't work. Let's kill him with our hands. Then, and that's what it says in the next pasuk. So you see the progression. First, they, you know, they go to Dotan, they start calculating, because the brothers, don't forget, they're righteous people. They're not sinners. So if they're going to kill someone, they need to make sure that it's legal, halachically, and morally. They're looking for all the rights to kill him. It's within our power, justified. So they're looking for the dat, for the religious allowance to kill him. And there was, by the way, you know, the brothers had a calculation. You know, Sef Forno goes into it, that the brothers were, um, were afraid that Yosef was actually a rodef. They viewed Yosef as a pursuer. You hear? They said, Yosef's trying to kill us by speaking gossip about us. Yosef's trying to kick us out of the family. So we have the right to defend ourselves like the halakha allows. Haba lehorgecha, hashkem lehorgo. If someone comes to kill you, not only can you, but you must stand up and defend and kill if you have to. You must protect your own life. And the brothers see this threat in Yosef. And again, there's a lot of interesting, uh, you know, pilpul and uh, study about, well, then if that's the case, then what they do that was wrong. But I don't want to get into that right now. Comes along, Pasuk, a few Pasukim later. They said, let's throw him in the pit. Let's throw him in the pit. Pasuk says, and of course, whose idea was this to throw him in the pit? Rashi calculates that must have been Yehuda's idea. Because, because uh, Reuven wasn't there and Shimon and Levi were um, they're the ones that wanted to kill him. One brother said to the other, let's kill him. Who's, where, where else do you see Ish El Achiv? We find that last week by again, Dina, Ish El Achiv, Shimon and Levi. So when it says they wanted to kill him, it's talking about Shimon and Levi. So when a, another brother comes and says, let's not kill him, let's throw him in a pit. It must be the fourth brother in line, Yehuda. And his, you see why in a minute why I'm, set, why I'm adding this, that it was Yehuda's idea. I'm just trying to get a picture a little bit of what's going on. So look at this, my friends. We get to Pasuk 28. Pasuk says, um, let's not, let's not, Vayomer Yehuda lahav ma beta kinaro getahinu vechisinu edamo lechu venem kerenu leishmaelim yadinu al tehibo ki ahinu besarenu hu vayishmu ahav. So Yehuda says, you know what, instead of killing him, let's just sell him to Ishmaelim. Pasuk 28, and here's what I want to focus on. Vaya'avru anashim midyanim soharim. So these Midianites pass by. Vayam shechu, vayalut yosef minabor, vayam kruit yosef la ishmaelim beesrim kasef. They come by, they pull him out of the pit, and they sell him to the ishmaelim for 20 kasef. Now, right away, you have to ask who, who was the one that pulled him out of the pit? And, and it see, it's very complicated, Pasuk. One more time. I'm going to read to you the Hebrew and then the English. And it doesn't make sense. Vaya'avru anashim midyanim soharim. Traders that were midyanim passed by. Vayim shechu vaya'alu et Yosef minabor. And then they drew him from the pit. Vayim keru et Yosef la Yishmaelim. And they sold him to Yishmaelim for 20 kasef. So who pulled him from the pit? Who sold him? You tell me there's Midianim, then you tell me there's Yishmaelim. Very complicated. So Rashi, Rashi comes and says something that's not so, not so clear when you think about it. Again, face value, what Rashi's going to say, say, what is Rashi adding? But you'll see in a minute, it's not the opinion of everybody. Rashi says, Vayim Shekhu, they drew him. Bnei Yaakov, 
the sons of Yaakov pulled Yosef min habor, la'ishmaelim, and they sold him to Ishmaelites. Ve'ishmaelim midyanim, ve'midyanim misrim. So Rashi says this is what happened. You ready? Follow me. The brothers pulled him out of the pit, sold him to Ishmaelim, who sold him to Midianim, who sold him to Egypt. Got that? Should we repeat it? Okay, if you want me to repeat it, Venmo me $20. No, I'm kidding. Okay, one more time. The brothers pulled him out of the pit, sold him to Ishmael, sold him to Midian, sold him to Mitzrayim. Rabbi Nubachir says, I don't know where you got that from. Because when I read the Pasuk, that's not what I understood. And I'll read it to you again. And by the way, if I read it to you slowly, you'll understand that Rashi is actually saying something that's not simple. Vaya'avru anashi midyanim, midyanim pass by, vayim shekhu, vaya'alu at Yosef bin Abor. And they pulled him out of the pit. You understand? So who pulled Yosef out of the pit? Says Rabbeinu Bachia, this is the Rashbam. This is a lot of opinions. So get it so we can read it the right way. Lefi hapshat, if you want to know really with a simple understanding. Ha'ovrim mashchu umachru. It was the bypassers that pulled him. The merchants, i.e. the Midianim. Lo ha'achim. The brothers never pulled him out of the pit. The brothers wanted to pull him out of the pit. That's how they started. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let us not kill him. But you know what happened a minute later? Before the brothers could get to Yosef, someone beat them to it. You know who beat them? The Midianim got to Yosef first. According to this, the brothers get to the pit to sell him. And they see there's no Joseph in the pit. Someone pulled him out. And so they have no idea, according to this, where Yosef even is. Did he escape? Did someone else pull him out? Was he sold? They don't know. But, it, but it's irrelevant because the brothers never ended up selling Yosef, according to this. And it's, by the way, very, very readable into the Pasuk. When you read the Pasuk, it's clear like this opinion. Rabbeinu Bahir, Ashbam, the brothers never sold him. It was only the Midianim that pulled him out. The brothers wanted to sell him. And there is something a little bit tragic here. There's something a little bit tragic. If you could just take a step back and study the past, the story. You see, the brothers, the brothers also have this evolution of thought. The brothers begin by let's kill him. And then they advance, they evolve, they grow, they mature. They say, let's not kill him. Let the snakes kill him. Let's throw him in a pit. And you know what? Even they realize that that's wrong. They say, let's sell him. Now, what do you think would have happened when they get to Yosef and they're about to sell him? I mean, they kind of, they kind of were able to make the right choice at every stage. Let's kill him. No, let's not. All right, let's throw him in the pit. Last second, they, they have mercy. Let's, let's sell him. What do you think would have happened last second? Last second. Probably mercy, right? You could assume. You could assume that the brothers, the same way they didn't kill him and they didn't let the snakes kill him at the end, they may have, they may have also not sold him either. But Yosef was sold. Because in order for sometimes in life for us, to be able to make that calculation that what I'm about to do is wrong, you need time. Sometimes a little time. Sometimes you say something, you blurt out something to your son or your daughter. And if only you could just have an extra five seconds to think about it, you wouldn't say that. If you could have an extra few seconds to think about what you're about to say to your boss, how many times we say something, we text something, Shoot, why did I say that? We said it in the heat of the moment. We said it angry. Right? Imagine we could undo in life. Imagine you had an undo button. Imagine I gave you, you know, the staples that was easy button. Imagine I gave you not a staples button. Imagine I gave you a undo button. 
And I said, I give you five undos a day. Ten undos a day. A hundred is undos a day. How many times a day do you think you would push that button? <laughs> I would push it a lot. Right? The brothers, the brothers, I'm sure if they would have gotten there. But you know what? And that, that chance never came. Because the Midianim beat them to it. And sometimes time is against us. Sometimes in life, we want to do something, but if we wait too long, we could lose out on the moment. If a mitzvah comes to you, my friends, don't delay, don't procrastinate. The brothers, 10 more seconds, they could have pulled Yosef out, they would have had remorse, they would have sent him back home, give him a little slap on the head. Don't do that again, all right, Joey? But um, they didn't have time. Sometimes time is against you. It's very sad to think about it from that perspective, that all of this would have been avoided with just a few more seconds. But the Midianim beat them to it. Now, Rabbi Bahya here has a problem. Well, what's the problem with all of this? There is a black and white contradiction. And you'll see in a minute why Rashi was forced to say what he says. Let's go. Can we fast forward, please, to Genesis 45.4. Fast forward all the way to the end of the story and spoiler alert. So if you don't know what happens, maybe pause the video here and stay tuned for two weeks from now. If you don't know the ending of the story, I'm going to give you five seconds to stop this video because I'm about to ruin the ending. Five, four, three, two, one and a half, one and one quarter, one. Okay, here we go. Yosef, fast forward to Prashiyot. Fast forward many years, he's the king of Egypt, or the viceroy of Egypt. And the brothers come in, and he plays with them back and forth, and finally he pulls off the mask, so to speak, and he says, I'm Yosef! And he says to them, Ani Yosef achichem, asher mechartem oti mitzrayma. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold to Egypt! So, very nice opinion, Rabbi Bahye. Sorry to say, <laughs> Joseph argues. <laughs> Patient Zero argues. The man himself, let him speak. The man himself, Yosef, seems to contradict. <laughs> There's a famous commentary on the Rambam. His name was the Briskarov. The Briskarov, Salavechik. Huge, huge commentary on the Rambam. Has very powerful essays explaining what he thinks the Rambam meant. You know, in Yeshiva, we used to joke that imagine in Shamaim, the Briskarov is going to be giving shir, he's going to be giving a class on what he thinks the Rambam argue, on what he thinks the Rambam means. And the Rambam is going to be sitting there and he's going to be like raising his hand, I disagree. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it's like, Yosef himself says, you sold me. And that's why Rashi says, he's forced to say, Vayavru in our pasuk, that when it says, who sold him, it has to be, the brothers sold him. Because Yosef tells us later on, the brothers sold me. Explains Rabbeinu Bachir, he knows, trust me, Rabbeinu Bachir knows that pasuk. So how does he, how does he explain it? He says, Ainyan must be, Ki hashlachtem oti labor, Yosef is saying that you didn't actually sell me, but you did throw me into the pit. As a result of which I eventually was sold. And therefore, even though you didn't sell me, but it's your fault. Because you led to me being sold. You never sold me. But you threw me in the pit, and the pit is where I was sold from. So we call in halakha grama. You caused, you led to. It says, you sold me to Mitzrayim. Now, he didn't sell him to Mitzrayim. Really, even according to Rashid, there's a problem. That the brother sell him to Mitzrayim, even according to Rashid for a minute. 
that the brother sold him. But who did the brother sell him to? The brother sold him to Midian or Yishmael and Yishmael to Midian and Midian to Misraim. So why is Yosef saying to the brothers, you sold me to Egypt? Because even you, Rashi, agree that it's a cause and effect. Eventually, I was down in Egypt and therefore it's your fault, even though you just sold me to Ishmael. So Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar just says, I'm just taking that one step further. And I'm saying, well, then even the fact that you threw me in the pit is enough to be considered your fault that I got sold. Very nice. Now, we know later on in history, the Romans, there was a, the, uh, the incident of the Asara Haruge Malchut. The ten martyrs, ten great rabbis, and we read about it on Tisha B'Av, we read about it at different times in the calendar. There were ten Jewish martyrs that were killed in the hands of the Romans, horrible deaths. And they, we know they are a, an atonement, a tikkun, for the ten brothers who sold Yosef. And it's a wild thing to realize now that the brothers are not only, the ten martyrs are not getting punished for selling Yosef. They're getting punished for causing Yosef to be sold. It's one step removed. But even for that, you have to pay. Because when you're as great as the Achim, as the brothers of Yosef, you have to pay. Even though you didn't sell him, you just sent him to a pit. But we consider it murder. As if you yourself killed him. Because you didn't actually kill him. You didn't actually sell him. But your actions caused him to be sold. And you have to calculate, you have to be very careful when you're on such a high level. Not only what you do, but what your actions can lead to. A person who's on a high level has to be careful not only what he does, but maybe what I'm doing, someone else is going to learn and watch me, and it'll lead them. And what is, what is that going to cause? And that's also on your shoulders. We find something similar. He brings a proof from David. David Amelech, we know the story with Bacheva and David, and he sees her on the roof, and he wants to marry her, and eventually he calls her husband Uriah um, to come back from battle, and he commands, he sends Uriah back home to be with his wife, Bacheva. Uriah politely refuses, and that's a big no no, you don't refuse the king, that's called Moreh Bamachut. So, David's like, all right, go back to war. And he sends a secret message to the general, uh, at the time was Yoav, to put Uriah in the Hazit. Hazit is the front line, but it also means Hazit in Arabic. <laughs> I don't know if it's a coincidence. So Hazit, he's now in the front line. So he puts him in the front line, and unfortunately for him, he was killed in the battle. And who killed him? Amon, who they were fighting. But Natan says to David, Pasuk says, when he rebukes David, Ve'oto harakta, you killed him. Now, did David kill him? I don't know about that. It's grama. En hefresh, says Rabbi Nubache. Look at this line. There's no difference. Ben haoreget havero beyadayim, whether you killed him with your hands, o hamesovev lo mita, or if you caused him to die through someone else. Whether it's you, or, or indirectly or directly, there's no difference. Vis-a-vis -vis Hashem, there's no difference. Maybe in the hands of courts, but in the hands of God, there's no difference. And again, how careful we have to be when sometimes we say things about someone. We could cause with our Lashon Hara, we could cause with our gossip, someone to break up. We could cause someone to lose a job. We could cause mahaloket, shalom bayit, issues. We could cause a fighting friends. We could cause someone to lose money. We could cause someone to get hurt. I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't do it. I just said. I just caused. But you can't call me guilty. At the end of the day, people have free choice. I didn't do it. They did it. In God's eyes, you are guilty. 
the brothers are guilty for selling Yosef, even though they never sold him. But you allowed for that situation to arise. Your guilt. Unbelievable. Now, there is a Rabbeinu Bahyeh. Let's see, we have a few minutes left. There is another Rabbeinu Bahyeh that connects to this, okay? So, I'm not leaving the topic. I'm staying on the topic, but I have to take you to another pasuk so we could gain a deeper understanding of really what's going on over here. So that's chapter 37, pasuk 28. That's all about the sale of Yosef. And we saw that the brothers who actually sold him and, you know, causing something. No, no, no. This is Rabbeinu Bahye. Okay, this is Rabbeinu Bahye. The briskerov was a side joke that I said. If it wasn't funny, please ignore that one. Okay? Parentheses. Okay? <laughs> Rabbeinu Bahye. We're on Rabbeinu Bahye's page today. Next. Now I'm moving, same topic, to a different pasuk. Chapter 38. Chapter 38. And now we fast forward after Yosef eventually winds up in Egypt. The story should have continued with Yosef, that he's tempted by his mistress, Potiphar's wife. But, but, pasuk doesn't go straight there. It tells us now a completely tangential topic called this episode of Yehuda and Tamar. At this moment in time, Yehuda also went down. And over here, Rabbeinu Bahia says that Really, we should have continued with Yosef going down. Not Yehuda going down. Who cares about Yehuda? This is Joseph's story. What happened to Yehuda is irrelevant. Well, let's see what he has to say. According to our rabbis, over here, our rabbis explain that it's a cause and effect. Because Yosef was sold, Yehuda didn't just descend, again, geographically. Yehuda descended in status, in rankings. The brothers removed him from his position. When they saw their father in pain. They said to him, It was your fault. You, would, you thought of it. You thunk it to sell him. And if you would have told us to return him, we would have listened. And it's your fault, Yehuda. And therefore, go down. So, Yehuda doesn't mean that he went down south. It means he went down in status. But, look at this. That's the Midrash. Again, there's always layers. Look at this. Beautiful to see layers. Pshat. Pshat. Yehuda went south. Okay? He went south. Drash. Yehuda lost. He went south in status, in position. V'aderech Kabbalah. You guys want to go a little Kabbalah today? For the Kabbalah fans. I know when I say Kabbalah, I could already sense your excitement through the phone. Everyone calm down. Okay. Sit down for this one. Samach Perashat Hayibum, the Perashat Mechira. We're about to go into the episode of Yibum, Leveret marriage. Yibum is when a brother dies. For those that are unfamiliar, when a bro- when someone dies without having children, let's say a man marries a girl and there's no kids and he dies. So halachically, the wife should do Yibum. It means she should marry the deceased husband's brother. She should marry her brother-in-law and they have kids. That's called Yibum. If the brother doesn't want to marry her, so they do the opt-out option, Chalitza, spitting in the shoe, which even till today applies. Actually, today we don't do the Yibum option. We don't allow it. Because for Yibum to be legal, it's got to be fully altruistic. If you're doing it because she's pretty, if you're not doing it for the mitzvah, then you lose, not only is it a sin, but you, you're marrying your brother's wife. That's, that's, that's asur. The only legal right is because it's yibum and you're doing it for the sake of having children. And we don't assume today people are, people are so pure in their thoughts. Maybe he's doing it because she's pretty. And therefore, we don't give yibum today as an option. Today you have to do the chalitza one. And, and today you, ha- you see, it happens. People that are in bedin, 
They have sometimes unfortunate scenarios that the lady comes because her husband died and she has to do the chalitza. But he says over here that the pasuk, you know why? It's juxtaposed. Yehuda going down to the sale of Yosef. I already gave you the pshat and I'm giving you the drash. Now I'm giving you the kabbalah, the sword. Because we want to connect Yibum and the sale. Kedel ismoch, because we want to connect Gilgul le Gilgul. We want to connect Gilgulim to Gilgulim. Reincarnation to reincarnation. Well, again, over here he's going into reincarnation. And reincarnation is believed by many in Judaism to be real. There are some that don't accept it. But Rabbi Dubachyeh clearly is going into it and he clearly believes in reincarnation. Ki soda yibum, hu soda gilgul. Because really yibum, if you want to understand why should it be that my brother, the brother of the deceased has to marry, that's really, if you understand gilgul, then you understand why. Min because it's known, sheachet ahu lo haya afshar leit barer leot laben rak besod gilgul, Basara Haruge Malchut. The same way when a brother does Yibum, it's Gilgul, it's reincarnation. So too, the ten brothers for selling Yosef, their Tikkun was only allowed through a reincarnation of the Asara Haruge Malchut. So if you want to know who says that the ten brothers came down again in the body, in a different body, through the ten martyrs, it's right here, Rabbi Nubachyeh says it. It's Gilgul Rabbi Nubachyeh. And it's only at that moment in time, after the ten martyrs were killed, that the full tikkun for the ten brothers was complete. He's being very, very poetic. He's alluding here to the Pasuk. Yosef tells his brothers, Go up in peace to dad. El avichem. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says it was only after the ten martyrs were killed that they could go up in peace to their father in heaven. So the ten brothers came back through the ten martyrs. And also, Er Onan, Hem Peretz Vezerach. And so too, in our story of Yehuda, Er Ve Onan, the two. The, um, the husband, the Er and Onan, who died, again, let's just get the story. Tamar was Yehuda's daughter-in-law. Tamar marries Er, Yehuda's son. So he's now her father-in-law, right? So Er marries Tamar, and Er dies. He died for, some say he was spilling seed. Whatever he did, Er died. Onan, the brother marries Er's wife, Tamar. Onan did the same thing, also died. Yehuda, fast forward, eventually marries Tamar, unknowing it was her. And they have two children, Peretz and Zerah. And over here he says that Peretz and Zerah are the Gilgul of Er and Onan. So you see, that's why we're juxtaposing these two episodes, because it's all about Gilgulim. The brothers came down again, and then Ed and Onan came down from Peretz and Zerach. Huma shekatu vayamot Ed ve Onan beeretz kenaan vayu bnei Yehuda. Okay, so what does he mean by that? Um, let's fast forward and I'll, and I'll try to open the pasuk. It says, after vayamot um, Ed ve Onan. Where is it? This is in actually Bamidbar. If you go to the book of Bamidbar, it says over there. Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Yehuda were, etc. But he's reading it and he's putting the period in the wrong spot. And basically, the way he puts the period, he says, 
וימות אל ואונן בארץ כנען ויהיו בני יהודה. אל ואונן died and they came back as the sons of יהודה. אוקיי? Okay? They came back to Gugul through פרץ and זרה. והנה זה מרמזי התורה מהמסגר יבין, this is obviously something that you have to know קבלה to understand. Now, so very fantastic stuff over here. One last piece, my friends, and then we'll end for today. Again, same, same topic. Now, we have to understand, why were there ten martyrs? How many brothers were involved in the sale? Ha'ahim, the brothers that were involved in the sale, lo ha'yu elatet, were only nine. Because there were twelve brothers, but Binyamin's not there. So that's eleven. He's too young. And Yosef is the victim, so that's ten. And he says, Hare Reuven, lo hizkim imahim. Reuven was, was objected. He left to help his father. There's nine. So why do we have ten martyrs? There should be nine martyrs. Yeshlomar, answer. Lefishigam Yosef hata. Wow. Whoa. You know who's the tenth? You know who's the tenth sinner? Nine brothers and Yosef. Yosef's guilty. The brothers was because of his instigation. By flexing his dreams, by going around and instigating, by wearing the coat in front of them. He was all being arrogant with his dreams. And therefore, you caused the brothers to sell you. You're part of the sale, Yosef. Again, you see, just tying it back to the idea of being a cause, indirectly. The same way, it's the brothers' fault that Yosef was sold, because they threw him in a pit. It's also Yosef himself's fault, because he had the dreams and, and showed them off. Wow, 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 wow. Unbelievable. So the tenth one is Yosef. Or yesh lomar, possibly another answer. Shalom nifkad al Yosef klal. It's not Yosef, but it's Reuven. But Reuven wasn't in the sale. He says, yeah, we're not punishing Reuven for the sale. We're punishing him for what he did with Bilha, moving of the beds, which was last week's parasha. And therefore, it's ten, the nine plus Reuven for a different sin altogether. But he still needed a tikkun for that sin. And that's what it means in Devarim, when Moshe says, about Reuven, Ve'hiyu metav mispar. He will be included in the number of the deaths. And he says that's a very deep, deep idea, but it's hinting to this point that Reuven's part of the ten because of what he did with Bilha Hayu Asara Im Reuven. And there I'll write a little bit more on this topic. But his population will be included in the count. He's included in the count of the ten martyrs because of a different sin of Bilha. But anyways, I mean, my friends, where, where, where will you find these gems? You ain't getting this in a 10-minute uh, sermon in shul, like I can guarantee you. This is uh, deep stuff. Baruch Hashem, we have these classes that we can dig a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper, Baruch Hashem. Um, so a lot of lessons for today. You know how careful we have to be not to cause things. How careful we have to be to let, not let time go against us. Uh, we spoke about Gilgulim. We spoke about uh, the brothers and Yosef himself being part of the guilt. You know, uh, as an example, when they say, Lashon Hara, Lashon Hara, there's three people that are guilty. The speaker, the listener, and the one who you spoke about. Why? What do you do? So that's, that's this idea. Because you spoke about him. He gave himself a reason to be spoken about by doing something negative in public. That's his fault. That's his fault. Again, what if someone, it's, if, if he didn't do anything bad and you're just lying, then it's not his fault. That's not even Lashon Hara. That's a different category of Moti Shemra. But either way, either way. A lot to talk about. Hashem should bless all of you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. We'll see you all tomorrow. God willing. Bye-bye.